Let's stand together. before you as your representative this morning as we join our hearts and minds in prayer let us bow our heads and our knees before him this morning <clears throat> our blessed and wonderful father in heaven we do humbly bow before you in your presence by your spirit we lay our lives open to you you see all things we come to you gratefully with offering and with praises but dear father we come also with concerns in our hearts for those this morning that might be hurting both physically and emotionally our hearts are joined to lift them before you father for those who are infirmed and cannot be with us we pray dear father we are desirous of hearing your voice this morning of listening for your word we pray that your hand will be upon our pastor as he speaks to our hearts that you would touch each one of us with that that we individually need for our lives we do praise you for your blessed son Jesus our loving Savior it is because of him that we are able to come this morning We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love towards us. May it be continued throughout all days that we have left to us. Until that day we see you in the clouds. We do ask it in your blessed name, Lord. And to the Father's glory. Yeah. 
as I was thinking about the prayer this morning, <coughs> I was considering the song in the old, old uh, church hymnal, I need the prayers of those I love. And I wish to convey that thought to you this morning, that as you leave and go your way, that there's someone that isn't here, that normally sits beside you. There is someone in your family. There is someone that needs your prayers. And as we pray for them, let us pray for one another, that we have the strength to continue. We have the very special opportunity this morning to take part in the gifts that he's blessed us with today. We have done so in prayer. And now I would ask that you would consider from your pockets the things that it's dear and dear to us, certainly, but it is the same things that are required for the preservation of our services here. And so I would invite you now, as the deacons come forward to receive our offering this morning, to consider what it is the Lord would have you to do today. Let's bow our heads. Gracious Father, we, we are so grateful for your love towards us this morning, and you provide the opportunities for us. You provide the blessing and our, our sustenance. We pray, dear Father, that as you supply our needs, that we are able to return to you those things that belong to you, those things that would bless others. It is in Jesus' beautiful name we pray and thank you. Amen. come from a multi-generational singing family. Much of our spiritual and worship life, we had family worship every morning and evening. 
um, as I was growing up uh, revolved around singing. And a few months ago, I collected all the books that I have from those years, beginning with Singing Tots, uh, uh, singing uh, Songs for Little Tots, the little, with a robin on the front, uh, Singing Youth, Gospel Melodies, Songs of Praise, and uh, I, I didn't use this as a child, but my, uh, the previous generation did, Christ in Song, and I'm fortunate to have a copy of the Christ in Song that was published as a souvenir edition by the Voice of Prophecy. So we were looking through this, and I found uh, some wonderful old hymns, and um, my brother and I uh, just a few weeks ago came across this one, which was also in the Black Hymn Book, but it really isn't a congregational hymn because it's rather complicated. It's, it's listed under Choir and Special. And if you're an old-timer, you probably will not recognize this, but if you are an old-timer, you may remember hearing this from time to time. The Voice of Prophecy and Mixed Quartets have a recording of it that I, that I recall. In Heavenly Love Abiding. Bathroom. 
timer. And thank you, choir. That was a good one. Uh, and Heavenly Father, I would like you to walk uh, with me here through this sermon and also to bless uh, my friends, my brothers and sisters, and also our uh, internet audience as they participate in uh, sharing the Word of God. Help us to leave this place with a firm determination to do your will and to glorify you. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Welcome around the Word of God, saints. Today is uh, the last sermon of this uh, sermon series. We've been on a long journey through the book of Judges. And today, as we conclude this uh, character tour of Judges, I would like to remind you what we've learned and to learn a few more things before we close the book of Judges. We discovered, we found out that in the book of Judges we can see our own reflection of human brokenness. We can see our own reflection of unfulfilled dreams, of coming short of what God has designed for us. And yet, behind the scenes of all these uh, human shortcomings, we were able to discern that the book of Judges is not about our shortcomings. The book of Judges is not about human beings. The book of Judges is actually about a great and merciful God who despite of our failings, in spite of our shortcomings, keeps on loving us. Even though we give up on Him, and turn our backs on Him. He keeps on pursuing us with His grace and love. And even then, when we give up on His divine dreams for our lives, He never gives up and still keeps on dreaming for you and me. Today, we are going to conclude the study about uh, the last judge described for us in the book of Judges, Samson. And I've titled this message, What is a nice God like you doing in a heart like this? <laughs> and when you look in the heart and the life of Samson, you cannot but wonder, what is Samson doing in the hall of fame of the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11? Last time we started uh, the journey about Samson and in my last message titled A Man, the man who was all muscle and eyeballs, we discovered that all the moral choices, the moral decisions in the life of Samson were done through his eyes. He saw a pretty lady in Timnah and he said, I have to have it, I have to have her. Even though his parents, even though the Word of God told him, not for you. He said, I have to have her. And in making all these uh, decisions, in this strange strategy of decision making, Samson ended up broken hearted. Because the Philistine lady that he fell in lust with, betrayed him even before the marriage ceremony was over. She did not keep his secret, he betrayed his secret, and then she married another man. And one will think that after such bad experience, after this failed marriage, Samson is finally going to learn the lesson. Yet we discover, and today we are going to study that, Samson is a dumb as a dumbbell. He learns nothing. And do you remember what we've discovered in the beginning of the study of Judges? There are only three types of people when it comes to how we handle life. 
and you fall in one of these three categories. Do you remember the, what were the first type of people when it comes to how we make decisions? Stupid, Stupid yeah, dumb people <laughs> who do mistakes and keep on repeating these same mistakes. These are dumb people. And some of you belong to this group, I'm sorry to tell you that. Then there is a second group. These are people who do mistakes, but they learn from their mistakes in order to never repeat them. And we call these people smart. But God wants us to belong to a third category of people. Do you remember what they were called? Wise, wise people. And wise people are those who pay attention to their Bibles, also pay attention to life, learn from other people's mistakes, so that they will not have to do these mistakes. And they will have a successful and pretty much uneventful uh, or only good events through life. God wants us, God wants you and me to be wise people, to learn from the Bible. Yet, Samson didn't learn anything. He decided to do his own mistakes and to keep on repeating them. And I would like to invite you uh, to open your Bibles with me to the book of Judges, chapter 16, where we are going to conclude the study of Judges and the study of the uh, life of Samson. Because the life of Samson is a miniature, it's a summary of the whole journey of the people of God through this period of uh, spiritual history. And you'll see this at the end. So who would like to read for us Judges chapter 16 verses 1 through 3. Judges 16, 1, 2, and 3. Oh, we have here um, uh, Mariana. Thank you. Let's hear Judges 16, and this, uh, this is the final chapter of Samson's life. One, two, three. One day, Samson went to Gaza, where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, At dawn, we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Thank you, Mariana. <laughs> uh, after Samson had one failed last affair, uh, what is he doing now? He goes to what city? What was the city called? Gaza. Gaza was 35 miles away from the hometown of Samson. 35. In the beginning, he went only four miles away to sin by marrying a lady that God told him in the Bible, don't do it. Now he goes 35 miles to sin. And here is the spiritual lesson. Some people tell me, oh, pastor, I don't know what happened. I just fell into sin. Uh, let me tell you something. We don't fall in sin. We slide and glide into <laughs> sin. Samson didn't, didn't fall overnight. He was planning and gradually increasing the amount of sinning. Till one day, he ended up in a brothel in Gaza. So, at first, Samson the Nazarene, who according to the Nazarite laws, was not supposed to eat grapes or to drink wine, did it. Then, uh, as a Nazarene, he was not supposed to touch a dead body. Lo and behold, we see him, we saw him last time, he eats out of the body of the carcass of a dead lion. And then, the, uh, the word of God and also the parents of Samson tell him, don't marry this lady from Timnah, don't marry this Philistine girl. But Samson said, she pleases my eyes 
and I've made my decision with my, my eyeballs already. She has a nice package. I don't care if she's empty inside and she proved to be empty. I like her, how she looks. And then the parents said, okay, we cannot do anything. And she broke his heart. And you'll think you'll learn out of that. Yet, now, he continues his gliding and sliding into sin. Because he takes a journey of 35 miles and he breaks the commandment of God and he goes and fornicates with a lady that he is not married to. And some of you may think, well, what's wrong with, not, with sleeping with a lady that is not your wife and you, or you're not married to? Uh, a lot. Uh, first, the, the Word of God uh, uses two specific Greek words for this sexual immorality. One word is moicheo, and it means cheating on your husband or on your wife. Okay, Samson was not married. The other word, listen to that, the other word that is used for sexual relationship outside of marriage, premarital, postmarital, sexual relationship outside of the marriage, the word that is used is pornea. Sounds familiar? This is the very same word where we have the word pornography from. So, Samson was a pornographer, and he was not just watching, but he went to spend the night with a lady who was a dispenser of STDs. And I would like you here to pay attention to something. This is, this is the spiritual lesson. If you have not paid attention thus far, pay attention to what I'm going to say next. Now, Samson went to Gaza, and what happened? He heard about the prostitutes, right? What happened? He saw. It's okay to see beautiful women. There are beautiful ladies around us. It's okay to see handsome guys. It's okay, it's okay to observe that someone is pretty or handsome. But what you do next after you've seen is very important. What did he do next? He just went up to her. He didn't consult his morals. He didn't uh, consider the Bible. He didn't consider God. He did what his eyes told him to do. And he went into her. Samson is uh, physically the strongest man in the world. No one ever <coughs> surpassed him. Yet, his physical strength is ex uh, exceeded only by his moral weakness. Anyone here like Samson? And then, here's the spiritual lesson. Samson wakes up in the middle of the night. One thing, people who uh, do sinning, and they don't know that they are sinning, they don't wake in the middle of the night. They sleep firm to till the morning, because they are exhausted of exercising. But he wakes in the middle of the night. Who woke him up? Who woke him up in the middle of the night? Someone told him that the Philistines are waiting to take his life. Someone woke him up to tell him that what he was doing is not right. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite authors, by the name of Ellen White, commenting on this uh, passage, she says, the Holy Spirit stepped down and spoke to the dirty heart of Samson, convinced him, convicted him of his sin, convinced him that this is not the right way to go, woke him up and told him to go, to leave this brothel. And then Samson wakes up and he figures out the city gates are closed. And what does he do? What did he do? He uprooted the gates together with the pillars, put them on, on his shoulders. And he walked uphill because Gaza is on the sea level. And Hebron, the Jewish city of Hebron, was 2,800 uh, feet over, above sea level, sea level. And he walked uphill for how many miles? 38 miles. And when he Hebron, 
he put the gates of the city there. By the way, there are excavations of Gaza, there are excavations of ancient cities. The gates of Gaza must have been way over a ton, most probably between two and three tons. This is humanly inimaginable that someone can do so. And then uh, run a marathon and a half uphill with this load on his shoulders. And then when he came to the Jewish city of Hebron, he left the city gates of Gaza as a souvenir to the Jewish people who actually, if you read chapter 15, came to him and bound him in order to betray him and to sell him to the Philistines. Question. Who did give this immense strength right in the middle of his sinning to Samson? Where did he get this strength right in the middle of the brothel? You've heard of anyone uh, walking uphill with uh, at least a ton, maybe ton and a half, two of a load for 38 miles? Who gave the strength of Samson? Did God take uh, his strength from him when he was sinning? Did he? No. God stepped down into the brothel and even further stepped down into the dirty heart of Samson. And through the blessing of power so that he can get free and alive out of this brothel. God was telling him something. I love you. The grace of God did not leave Samson when Samson is in the pit of his sinning. Even long after we have deserted God, long after we have turned our backs on God, God keeps on blessing us. And you may wonder why. What is this holy God doing in our dirty hearts? What is this awesome God doing, stepping down and keeping on blessing people that spit in His face with their attitudes? You know what God is doing? When we are in the middle of our sinning, God is showering us with His blessings, with His strength. So that when we wake up, we'll look back and we'll remember all these blessings that God gave us in the middle of our dirty pit. And we'll come back to Him. As a matter of fact, the word for repentance in Hebrew, shuv, literally means to turn around and come back to God because we've run away from Him. And God in His mercy does not stop blessing you when you are sinning. Do you know what's the problem? Many Christians, many people who are blessed while they are still marinating in their sin, misread, misinterpret, misunderstand the blessings of God and take them as a sign that God approves of what they are doing. No, God does not. He did not approve of Samson going down into the brothel of Gaza. He did not approve of him marrying the uh, wife uh, of Timna, the Philistine girl. Nevertheless, God was blessing Samson so that when he wakes up, he will remember and come back to God. Now, who would like to read for us verses 4 and 6, which will reveal again that Samson is a dumb as a dumbbell because he didn't learn anything from his mistakes. He keeps on repeating them. So who would like to read for us verses 4 through 6? Uh, Kathy Matthews, thank you, uh, Kathy. Let's hear verses 4 through 6 and uh, uh, the story of a very famous lady by the name of Delilah. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secrets of his great strength and how we can overpower him, so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Hmm. You know what? God blesses us 
God loves us and he blesses us even in the middle of our sinning but the time comes when God changes the tactics, <coughs> tactics of teaching us spiritual lessons when we don't learn through blessings God takes the blessings away so that maybe when he takes our blessings away we are going to wake up and see so Delilah was Samson's last last affair and when Samson fell in lust with Delilah what did the lords of the Philistines do? what did they do? they say now we know how to get him what did they do? they decided to bribe Delilah and uh, the Philistines they had they were a pentapolis that means uh, the city the, uh, the country of the Philistines was ruled by five kings uh, residing in five cities one of which was Gaza which was actually the strongest and the biggest of all the Philistine cities so these five lords came to Delilah and told her each one of us is going to give you 1100 shekels how much total? how much total? 5500 uh, shekels do you know how much money is that? this is an enormous bribe Joseph in the book of, Ju uh, of uh, Genesis was sold for 20 shekels the price of a slave at that approximate time was 20 shekels with 5,500 shekels you can buy 275 slaves you can live like a king so who can blame Delilah that she sold out Samson? really? well Samson likes a pretty package even when outside is hollow and empty and nothing is there so this lady is willing to sell him out and I would like to tell you something if you like dating Philistine boys and girls they're gonna sell you out if they don't have morals that stick to this book they're gonna sell you out maybe not for money for something else but they're gonna sell you out so Delilah is willing to sell Samson for 5,500 shekels and this shows this uh, enormous bribe shows how desperate the Philistines were to get into Samson's secret and then I'm gonna tell you what happens next in verses 7 through, 11, uh, through 14 verses 7 through 14 tells us that three times this lady comes to Samson and tells him tell me what's your secret and she nags him nags him and nags him till he kind of uh, tries to give her some answer but she's persistent she she tries to find out if this is the true answer every single time she tests him and every human being that has his brain in the right place not in his eyes will discern that this lady is trying to cheat him he, she's trying to sell him yet Samson is strong like a bull and almost as intelligent like one because he sees nothing Samson is so in lust with this lady that she is betraying him right in front of his eyes and he cannot see it lust blinded Samson's eyes and I have a question for you what is blinding yours? and then the story continues actually this is a, a very interesting part of the story where Samson is about to learn some spiritual lessons the hard way so who would like to read for us verses 15 through 19 Thank you, Bill. Uh, let's hear verses 15 through 19 and hear how finally Delilah got to Samson. Then she said to him, 
How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have told me where your great, have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death, that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Uh, go on to, to 19. <coughs> to 19. When Del Delilah saw that, she, that he had told her all his heart and sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for the men and had him shaven off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. Okay. Uh, do you hear what she's saying? Do you hear the, the words of uh, Delilah? If you lost me, you'll do as I please. And Satan has used this old trick so many times and it worked every single time unless unless you are a man or a woman of God that stands firm rooted on this book the strange thing is that Samson heard these same words in chapter 14 when his wife-to-be tells him if you love me you're gonna be you're gonna tell me the riddles Solution, so that I can go and tell it to the Philistine guys and they betray you. And Samson did it in chapter 14 and he had to buy 30 three-piece suits, Georgia Armani, for the guys who basically played together with his wife. And then his wife married another guy. Samson has heard this, if you love me, but he has learned nothing. And guess what? There are many in the Adventist church who do not learn either. There are many Christians who do not learn either. Because the Philistine boyfriend comes to the Seventh-day Adventist Philistine girl and he tells her, if you love me, you're going to sleep with me even before we are married. And the dumb Seventh-day Adventist Philistine listens to him and sells her principles out in order to please him. Because she wants to prove to him that she loves him more than she loves the Word of God. For the love of a woman, Samson sold out his calling from God. For the love, or the last, should I say, of Delilah. Samson sold out his eyes, his heart, and his calling. Samson can, uh, agreed to enter Delilah's barber shop. And when he did, this day, he had a very very bad hair day. As a matter of fact, it was so bad that she got even his eyes. And do you know what happened? I don't know if you listened very well to verse 19. What happened after Samson was powerless? What happened after Samson was powerless? The first person to mock him for his powerlessness were not the Philistines. The first person to mock him and to hurt him and to break his heart was Delilah. You know what, my friend? Delilah was appear appealing to Samson's love. And now, she's the first one to hurt him. The Philistine boyfriend 
who is going to appeal to your love is going to be the first one to hurt you and to ridicule you because you're neither Philistine nor, nor Adventist and you'll end up broken hearted. Wise people learn from the mistakes of fathers. They don't, they don't do their own mistakes. And then let's read verses 20 and I would like to add to that verse 21. So let's read these two verses, 20 and 21, to see what happened as a result of this betrayal of Delilah. Come on guys, don't be shy. I know it's a tough topic, but uh, we are going to learn a lot of spiritual lessons, hopefully, that will help us through life. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for saving me. So let's hear uh, chapter 16, verses 20 and 21. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. Thank you, Phil. You know, this is one of the saddest statements of the Bible. He didn't know what? He didn't know what? That God has left him. It's so sad to think that you're still a good Christian, that you're still a Seventh-day Adventist. And to not realize that the power of God and the blessings of God have vanished. Only to wake up and to see the people that you've trusted and you sold your faithfulness to God to, to see the same people mocking you, insulting you, hurting you. They mock you that you are a hypocrite and all Christians are hypocrites like you. You pretend to have high values, but look at you. You're powerless like us, the Philistines. And the people to whom you sell your faithfulness they are going to do that. The moment you become weak, they are going to be the first one to ridicule you. Yet, here is the gospel. Thank God. He does not leave us completely when He has taken His blessings away. Thank God that He is still there. And I would like here to tell you a few things that I hope will help you in your personal spiritual struggles with your personal pet sins. You remember that we discovered that Samson's brains were where? In his eyes. All the decisions he made with his eyeballs. Do you know what our Lord Jesus says? Let's read it together. Ready? Go. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. The problem was that it was uh, not just Samson's right eye that caused him to stumble. Samson had problem with both of his eyes. And while this text does not tell us to physically mutilate ourselves. What Jesus means here is to spiritually do this process, to do the process from inside out. Yet, because Samson didn't want to do the process from inside out, God let it, God allowed the Philistines to do it from outside in. Samson had to be blinded spiritually, physically in order to start seeing spiritually. Do you need also the same treatment? Do you have to learn from your own mistakes? God has put down these words so that we can learn from Samson's and other people's mistakes and be wise. And I would like us uh, to read together the best text of the book of Judges. This is the best promise in the book of Judges. Let's read it together. Ready? Go. However, the hair of his head 
began to grow again after it had been shaven. This is the greatest promise in the book of Judges. You know what? Let me tell you something. If you look at the text and you're wondering, <laughs> what's up with this text? It's obvious that when you shave, your hair will grow. Friends, the Bible does not have time to waste or space to waste with empty words. The Bible does not make a statement about biological processes that are so obvious. The Bible would like to tell us here something. Do you remember the hair of Samson was a symbol of his covenant with God. You remember that? And while the hair was growing and the Bible noticed that, it means that something was happening in the commitment and the covenant between Samson and God. While his hair was growing, so was also his commitment and repentance to God. Samson was gradually starting to see spiritually. And friends, while Samson was there in the dungeon, while his eyes, who made him stumble so many times, were taken away, he had a lot of time to contemplate, to reevaluate his life, and to come back to God. I would like to ask you a question here. If the hair of Samson was a symbol of his strength, and it was obvious that this was the symbol of his strength, why didn't the Philistines shave him clean every single day? If they know this is his uh, strength, why didn't they shave, shave him clean every single day? What? What, what did you say, uh, uh, John, John? They are dumb oh. too. Okay. <laughs> They are dumb too. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Phil. Good. Good spiritual lesson. I didn't know about this one, but now I know. They are dumb too. Well, let me tell you why didn't they shave him. Because the Philistines and all the pagan people did not believe in God who gives second chances. According to all pagan religions, religions you offend God. You betray God. Forget it. This God is never going to love you and never going to accept you back. Never. They did not believe in our God, the God of second chances. They did not believe that God can forgive and restore this man. And here is the gospel, friends. God is a God of second chances. God does not desert you when you betray him. God does not turn his back on you because you spit in his face. And even when physically humanity did this to our Lord Jesus, he was praying from the cross, Father, forgive them because they have no idea what they are doing. So, to recap that, the story of uh, Samson, and it's also the story of uh, the judges. The story of Samson is, if you wish, a summary or rerun of the whole story of the failures in the book of Judges of the people of God. And there are two important lessons I would like you to take from the book of Judges. If you forget anything else that we've studied, two important lessons that will transform your life. The first one, Samson's story, the story of the failures in the people in the book of Judges, is a constant reminder of the high cost of low living. Low living is going to devastate you spiritually. Gouge your eyes and leave you broken hearted. For Satan is a lot like Delilah. He beguiles you into doing what he wants. He makes you fall in love or in lust with him and his goodies. And once you've sold God, he takes your strength away. And then he sends the Philistines to mock you. Low living is not worth the price. It's a too high of a price tag to pay for the small pleasures 
and the toys that Satan and Delilah's of this life give you. The second spiritual lesson that I would like us to take home is the story of Samson, the story of the judges, reveal that we serve an extremely, immeasurably merciful and gracious God. Maybe, like Samson, you have your own pet sins that blinds you. Maybe, like Delilah, Satan has lulled you into slipping away and snoring spiritually, not realizing how far you've gone from God. And then he's going to wake you up when you've completely sold out your allegiance to God. And then he's going to start whispering in your ear, the Philistines are over you and God does not love you anymore. You are like one of us. Don't you ever believe him. Because even when God has taken his blessings away from you, he's teaching you a lesson. He's calling you to come back home. When you wake up, do not listen to this satanic whisper that God cannot forgive you, cannot restore you, and cannot make a hero of the faith out of your failures. Do you know that in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 32, Samson, this broken, dirty, lustful human being is listed in the hall of fame among all the heroes of the faith. Do you know why? Not because of what he did, but because of what God did. And no matter how broken you might be, no matter how far you have gone in your spiritual walk from God, when you wake up, would you please come back to Him? Because He's going to forgive you. He's going to give you a second, third, hundred and, th and third chance. And He's going to make you a hero of faith. Would you please uh, help me out and uh, let's make some decisions at the end of this uh, message. Pull out of your bulletin this yellow connection card. Turn it to the back. And I would like us to make a few action steps in response to God's message and God's desire to make us heroes of His faith. The first step, the fact that a man like Samson is described as a hero of the faith gives me hope that I can become a hero, a heroine of faith too. If you feel that God is calling to your heart and this is exactly what he's trying to do in your life, check this one. Second action step, Lord, help me to never exchange your high calling for a low immoral living. And finally, God, I am astonished by your grace that you bestow on me daily. Thank you, Jesus. Your goodness amazes me. together we'll do the the middle three verses without the organ the middle three verses without the organ
bow our heads for the benediction, please. And now, to whom he is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before his presence, in glory and in exceeding joy, to God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.